Uh, I would burn down all the houses and kill all the animals, and, and I was literally a little Damien. Uh, I, I was so messed up in my mind, I, I couldn't be around people without thinking about how I was going to kill them. Uh, my mind was bombarded with murderous, horrific, heinous, wicked, vile, treacherous thoughts. I, I couldn't sleep. I'd have to get so drunk that I'd pee myself half the time just to sleep because I was so oppressed. Oppression means the troubling of the mind. And so, finally my mom, who wasn't a Christian at the time, kicks me out to this Christian home to have them cast demons out of me because I was messed up. And, and uh, it was a Colbert family, beautiful family. And, and so, I had been a Christian probably since I was younger because even my grandparents took me to, to church. I lived there. They made me go to church. I had to. And... And so, but it, when, I, when I was looking at this life sentence, I think it was the eighth time I was looking at a life sentence. And, and I was looking at a life sentence in Louisiana. They wanted to give me 20 years. We call it anything over 20 years a life sentence. 20 years and above is a life sentence, what we call it. And so here I am looking at this life sentence. And I knew that only God could deliver me. So I picked up the Bible and I started reading it all day, every day. And I tried to do everything that it said. My theology was messed up. I wanted to try to... Uh, uh, coerce God or manipulate God into doing something for me. But what I did, if I woke up in the morning and I had to use a restroom, like that's kind of normal, right? I would pick up my Bible and I'd be reading a verse as I went to the bathroom. Because I knew that God was watching and I knew that only He could deliver me from this life sentence. We had this old chaplain that, that used to come in there and, and he was a beautiful expression of Christ. I'd never seen anybody teach like him before nor after. He would go around the room and he knew what verse to ask each person to read. And then he'd ask them a question that made them come up with the answer to what that verse meant. And after about, I think, four months, I had my Bibles all written up. And there you could see that it was the blue Gideon Bible. And you could see that the white handprints from me opening it so many times and holding it so many times. I wore the paint off of it in four months. And so, if I remember right, it took me two months to read it straight through. All day, every day. Um... And that was without any commentary, no study Bible, just a regular Gideon Bible. And so, um, one day I was up in my cell, we were on the second tier, and uh, my cellie comes in, he kicks the bunk, and he says, Asa, 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 you're going to go to church. When he said my name the second or third time, the Lord said audibly, Asa, humble yourself and I'll lift you up. Immediately I started coming off, off the bed, and, but I was trembling and just struck dumb and speechless. So I do it a push-up, and then I, I'm trembling, and I, I come out to that second tier, and I'm just in awe and speechless. And that old chaplain looks up, me, up at me, and I've never seen him excited about anything, but today he's like, Hi, Asa, how are you today? And I'm like, uh, uh, what does humble mean? <laughs> he doesn't even answer me. He just says, turn your Bible to Romans 7, chap verse, chapter 7, verse something. And, and he says, read it. So I read it, and he goes, what does that mean? He assumed that I knew what it meant. And I responded, still trembling, I, uh, uh, I don't know. And he looks at me like he's confused, like a little frustrated, right? And he says, turn to chapter 10, Romans 10, such and such, R read it. So I read it, and he asked me again, he goes, what does that mean? And still trembling and struck dumb, I, I said, I don't know. And he was clearly frustrated at this point, and he walked out, and we didn't even have church that day. The next day, the cops came in and they told me, Harrison, roll it up. And I'm like, what? Well, roll it up. What do you mean? Where am I going? I haven't been to court yet. Roll it up. And the cops, breaking all kinds of laws, he says, you're going to go before this judge. You're going to plead guilty to a misdemeanor. And if you come back again, we will feed you to the crocodiles. And I said, man, I'll leave your whole state. <laughs> I'm gone, right? And so they did. They, they did just that. I'm not sure what that old chaplain told the, 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 the judge. The chaplain had the, he was a state officer. Uh, chaplain that was recognized by the governor of Louisiana and he could go into any institution in that state and preach the gospel Just a beautiful expression of Christ and so And I know that there's theological implications to this testimony, but and I won't go through that, but um, it, the, the point that I wanted to make is that I was diligently seeking him. I was desperate It was that one of my worst fears was to do the rest of my life in prison and, and, and I deserved it multiple times. Um, but, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, when, and it's it's kind of uh, unfortunate, but that fell onto my son, actually. My son ended up getting a life sentence. He, he, uh, he ended up, he, he ended up, what's that? 
he ended up getting a life sentence and um, it broke my heart. If I ever thought I was a bad dad before, oh, I knew now, right? But long story short is, is that we cannot manipulate God to, into doing anything. He's going to act according to his character every time and he, and he can't act inconsistent with his character or nature. But he does desire for us to seek him diligently in a sense, with a sense of desperation. Because submission and desperation go hand in hand. That's why I, was, I would bring every thought into captivity. I quit lying. I quit looking at women lustfully. I quit. I didn't do. I tried to do everything that the Bible said. And and then and then I had like that encounter with the Lord. Uh, now I'm not saying that that's going to happen to you because it's very rare. Scripture even says that the the, the word of the Lord was rare in the days of Samuel. Um, uh, but he 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 is he's. he's when you look at woman, woman is made in the image of God. And she wants to be desired. She wants to be wanted. Try to look, like I said before, if you walk down the street with one and you look at another one, she's going to smack you. Right? So same thing with the Lord. God is jealous for our affections and will tolerate no rivals because he has none. So, and, and I've said, like I said yesterday, what is an idol? An idol is anything that, uh, that consumes my mind it, 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 it consumes my affections and, and becomes the controlling factor for my decisions in life. God wants us to know his law, but he wants us to be devoted to himself, not just a bunch of rules. And they're important to know. They're absolutely important to know. I love the law of God. But he, he, we want, he wants us to move on in this relationship with him in in a, in a hunger and thirst after him. I want deliberately to encourage a longing after the ineffable majesty on high. He's the only one worthy of praise. He's the only one worthy of affection. He's the only one worthy of glory and strength and honor and might and rule and dominion and authority. He's the only one worthy of awe, splendor, majesty. And, and, and he's, he's worthy of our devotion. He wants us to be devoted or consecrated to him. He wants us to be devoted to him. It's repentance isn't so much I turn away from evil as much as it is I turn away from evil and turn to God. And so it, it, repentance is vital. It says godly sorrow, worldly sorrow produces death. In other words, if I'm sorry because I got caught or I'm sorry because of the consequences of my actions, this is what we call worldly sorrow. So I want you guys to be able to decipher between the two because there's two types of repentance. One that leads to life and salvation and the other that leads to death. So if, if you guys, if anybody in here is, is using alcohol and drugs because, because they desperately want to please the Lord, I'll tell you, myself, that's, that's, why I, that's why I used to use is because I was miserable. I was wretched. I hated the fact that I sinned. Not that I hated, not that I hated the consequences of my sin. Of course, I did, but I just despised the fact that I sinned, and that's because I had been reborn from on high by the will of God, not by a, a little prayer that I prayed 15 years ago. Because remember, salvation is—I repented 20 years ago, meaning I'm still repenting today. I believed 20 years ago means I'm still believing today. So these are these are vital for us to know. Uh, the scripture says that uh, in that day many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? And he'll say, get away from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And that Greek word is the same word that's used uh, in, in John 17, 3, where he says, and this is eternal life, that we might know you. And Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, to know, and that's where noskos, where we get the word Gnosticism. And, and what it means is it means experiential knowledge of, empirical knowledge of, intimate exclusivity. It's, it's a euphemism, meaning it's a, uh, uh, it's a way of, a euphemism is, how do you explain a euphemism? Um, when, when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said that she was going to conceive and that, 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 she would, that, that God would be born inside of her from, from the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. And she said, how is this to be? I've never known a man. Same in the Septuagint where Adam knew Eve and they had a baby. Right? So it's a euphemism for intimacy. And so 
And this is what God desires. He doesn't. He, he wants us to to count Him as precious to us. He wants to consume our thoughts. Just like I said before, when you got your first girlfriend, what was her? Jessica, right? Everybody's tired of hearing about Jessica. Why? Because all you're talking about is Jessica this, Jessica that, Jessica this. People get tired of hearing about Jessica. Why? Because you love Jessica. One of the best ways to tell when you're saved is you go around and tell people about Christ. Now that's a more mature in, in the walk. That's not, that's not guaranteed. You don't have to have that when you're first converted. It generally happens. 